And it's because we see some of those ideals as under attack that we decided to put on this tour, to put on events like this. So over the next couple of months, through the Unsafe Space Tour, we're bringing together some of our favourites, some of the most eloquent defenders of free expression, critics of a new climate on campus, which seems to be about shutting down discussion, um, to really try and get to grips and interrogate that climate. And tonight, we're talking about what is, I think, for my money, the most contentious aspect to this discussion, that of identity politics and how it relates to free speech on campus. Now, from Spite's perspective, we come from a left-wing, universalist, anti-racist history. We always understood race as something which was a nasty concoction which we needed to transcend. And yet, when we look at UK campuses, US campuses in particular, we see a new form of racial difference, effectively, kind of being reified in politically correct terms from the rise of things like cultural appropriation, the idea that culture splits along identity lines um, through to the rise of things like microaggressions where policing speech and wanting to effectively lay out some kind of etiquette as to how people should interact with one another to us seem to be the warning signs of something which was reifying that kind of divisiveness on campus. And increasingly something that I think we see, of course, is the idea that one's identity naturally leads to one's ideology and that anyone who questions that is questioning you as a person and through all sorts of different aspects of debate on campus today, I think we see that bear out. So the key question that the panel here are gonna address and that we wanna hear your thoughts on is if we're in a climate in which we're urging students of different backgrounds to kind of tiptoe around each other, um, if we're telling them that culture divides along these kinds of lines and if ultimately we're suggesting that identity is something really important that we should talk about all the time, even in the, abscess, even in the absence sorry, of any of the kind of explicit racism we might have seen in the past, are we actually getting further away from that position that we say we all want to be in, which is transcending race and difference and identity altogether? So that's what we're going to be speaking about. So I'm going to introduce the panel very quickly in the order in which they'll speak. They're going to speak for about five minutes and I'm going to kick it out to you guys as soon as possible. So first up, on my immediate left, we have Camille Foster. So Camille is a co-founder and a partner at Freethink Media, which is a fantastic company, production company, that make documentary film about people at the, at the forefront of human innovation, the kind of unsung heroes, which is fantastic stuff. But he's also a real rising star of um, commentary and issues of public policy, and he has a great podcast as well called The Fifth Column, which I can highly recommend. So after Camille, there we go. <laughs> After Camille, so sat right next to him is Brian Stazkavage. So Brian is a free speech advocate, he's a writer, and he's a student at Wesleyan University. Um, he became quite notorious, I think it's fair to say, in 2015 when he wrote an article for the Wesleyan Argus, um, which was, I would say, kind of gently critical of Black Lives Matter in relation to what he saw as its tactics should be. As a result, um, there were many protests, there was calls to not only defund, but I think recycle the paper. Um, and so he's someone who's really been at the coal face of this and has been really interesting the way in which he's put his case. So it's great to have Brian here as well. And after Brian sat there on second from the far right, we have Sarah Hyder. So Sarah is a writer, she's a speaker, she's an activist, she's one of the founders of the ex-Muslims of North America, arguing for atheism, for human rights, for free speech, and it's someone who Spike definitely very much admires, so it's great to have Sarah here as well tonight. And then last, but by no means least, on um, my far left, down the end there, we have Mark Liller. So Mark is a professor at Columbia University of Humanities and is a regular contributor to the New York Review of Books and the international press. Um, and his, he made himself um, a little bit notorious in 2016 when he wrote an article um, for the New York Times called After Identity Liberalism. It became the most read article on the website of the year and has now birthed a new fantastic book called The Once and Future Liberal After Identity Politics, which I can highly recommend to all of you. So that's Mark. So I'm going to ask the speakers, as I said, to speak to about five minutes. Panel, I'm going to be quite tight on timings. And the reason for that is we really do want to bring it out to you guys as soon as possible. If you haven't already noticed, you soon will. Most of these guys are broadly critical <laughs> of identity politics. They come at it from different angles, but nevertheless. But what but this event is as much about you guys as it is about them. We're devoting as much of the time as possible to a real discussion between the floor and the panel. And even if you vehemently disagree with the whole framework of what we're talking about, we want to hear from you. We want to hear your points. That's what all of this is about. So in that spirit, that's what we'll continue on with. But without further ado, Camille, if you'd like to kick us off. Sure. 
Uh, well, first, thank you very much to Spike. Uh, thanks so much for all the, to all of you for coming out. Um, I hope that this will be a productive, interesting, engaging conversation. Um, I hope that everyone here sort of has an opportunity to engage either during this or afterwards. Um, I hate throat clearing, but I'm going to do a little bit of it anyways in the hopes of being understood. Um, I'm generally, in contexts like this, often talking about race and, and related issues, um, and often in the context of criminal justice reform. Um, I believe in the necessity of criminal justice reform. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that we look at ways that we can reform police departments to get to better outcomes. I think it is a travesty when civilians who are engaging with the police in something as routine as a traffic stop or your light being out or something else um, find themselves in a situation where they are staring down the barrel of a gun. This is problematic. It is far worse when you find yourself shot as a consequence of this engagement with the police. I think we all agree on this. Here's the part where it starts to get slightly dicey. Um, I think when I look at the numbers uh, that there is very little evidence that black people are at unique jeopardy of being shot by the police when we do something other than just look at the demographics of the country, right? Black people are, you know, 12.5% of the population overall, but they do make up a much larger share, and this is important, and this is an excuse, but it's important to recognize, of stops and in terms of being victims in both perpetrators and victims of violent crimes. When we actually look at police shootings and various other things with respect to that, oftentimes we will find that disparities in outcomes seem to disappear, i.e. the probability of getting shot by the police when you're stopped by the police, when we control for things like rates of violent crime, seem to disappear. Like there's no difference between say blacks and whites. In fact, some white guy might be more likely to have something bad happen to him. Why do I make that point? Um, for me, it seems impractical to take an issue that we all agree is important and to balkanize it and to make it something that is of unique interest to a particular community, to attach to it a mantra that is narrowly interested in racial outcomes, to make it an issue where if you disagree with me, you don't disagree on an approach to fixing this problem. You don't disagree on whether or not it matters if I survive. You, well, I'm sorry, you don't disagree with it on approach, you disagree on whether or not my life has value and merit. We find ourselves in this country in a time where there is a protest taking place with the NFL. Um, there are players, athletes, coaches at this point who are taking knees on the field. Um, and there's a president of the United States who is um, doing things that I think are highly inappropriate. It is wrong for the president, either de facto or de jure, to suggest that people should be fired from their jobs for holding a particular point of view. This is unequivocal, it's obvious, I see heads nodding, so we all agree on this point. I'm not suggesting anything other than that. I do think, however, that if we're going to have a conversation about criminal justice reform, and if we're interested in policy, if we're interested in making changes, then we ought to be interested in the facts as well. And if this isn't primarily an issue about race, one wonders if taking this issue, criminal justice reform, for example, and putting it in that narrow lens is the appropriate thing to do. Um, I'm going to stop there for a moment um, and sort of let this go down, and hopefully we'll have uh, an opportunity to go further down the road. But again, uh, I think the folks you're going to hear from have had an opportunity to meet for the first time tonight. Reasonable, sane, no one here, I, I suspect we agree on far more than we disagree. Um, so the notion that anyone would be sort of upset leaving here uh, wouldn't be surprising to me. Um, but uh, I look forward to chatting, um, and thank you so much for, uh, for hearing me out. Thanks so much, Camille. <laughs> Brian. All right, thank you very much to Spiked and to Rutgers for having us all here. <clears throat> I'd like to start off first by just telling a short story. In the spring of 2011, I was sitting in a palace in Baghdad, Iraq. I was working on the classified newspaper of Iraq. When a coworker sat down next to me and asked me how would I would survive at college? Because he knew how strong my political viewpoints were, but how would I handle hearing an opposing viewpoint? My response to him was, 
If Osama bin Laden taught a class, I'd be the first person to sign up. That was the worst person I could think of at that time. So to translate it to 2017, if Richard Spencer or Michael Moore or any one of these characters that we deem as radicals, left or right, were to teach a class, I would be the first person to sign up. Not because I was worried that they would convert me <clears throat> or they would say something that I might agree with. It's because I disagree with them, but I still want to hear from them why they're saying the things that they're saying. So now I'm going to do a little bit of audience interaction and ask a couple of questions. How many people of here have either read or listened to or watched an interview with one of these so-called hate groups? How many of you were convinced? How many of you are worried that somebody else might be convinced by those words? How many of you here were convinced? That's the issue. We have a nation that is afraid. We have a nation that is suspicious of each other. But when we actually sit down together and look around and see, we can see that n these ideologies are not actually propagating, they're not disseminating. The students that are here, are you're gonna be the leaders, you're gonna be the managers, you're gonna be the legal experts, the medical experts, and yet these ideologies are not spreading. This, I believe, is a problem due to activism. Specifically, activist leaders and media pundits who are more concerned about winning either personal, political power, for their own causes or whatnot. But it's creating this dangerous inconsistency where a majority of Americans are not being convinced by these ideas, and yet we are extremely fearful that white supremacy is right around the corner. How is this possible? It's possible because there's been a concentration of bad news. I hear people saying Charlottesville. We're coming out to the audience in a couple of minutes. If you just let Brian make his point, we'll come back out very soon. But I look across the left wing and the right wing news, and it's a concentration of the worst of the worst that each side has to offer. We're seeing headlines from that Trump supporter that says something bad, or that CBS legal analyst who dismisses the, uh, the shootings today, or last night. This is the problem. We're concentrating bad news on both sides and then we're evaluating each other based off of these incorrect perceptions. If, as the left has argued, that Islam cannot be criticized because of the actions of a couple of extremists, if we can't criticize liberal movements for the actions of the GOP baseball shooter, for those people that are saying Charlottesville. These, this is not the center of gravity. These are the extremists. And it's being driven by identity politics, which has eloquently said, balkanized ourselves so that we are suspicious of each other. This is the issue. Trump supporters, by and large, that I've talked to, go to great lengths to say how much they despise white supremacy and white nationalism. Their criticisms of social justice, comma, identity politics is not an attempt to bring back white supremacy. It's an idea that there's a contrarian voice, a critical voice about social justice that can be made without bringing back white supremacy. It's about meritocracy. It's about creating an equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome. This is what college campuses miss especially the activist leaders that are 100% convinced in their views. When you become 100% convinced in your views, that's when bad things happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Sarah. Hello. Um, so thank you, Tom, for the introduction. And 
I'm really happy to be here and I'm really happy to talk about this. Um, I'm an activist, uh, I'm a writer, I'm a co-founder of an organization called Ex-Muslims of North America. Um, and we're an organization uh, which advocates for the acceptance of religious dissent, we promote secular values, and we aim to reduce discrimination faced by those who leave Islam. Uh, we've been building communities of um, ex-Muslims, that is to say, uh, people who used to be Muslim but then left the faith and are now atheists or agnostics. Um, we've been building communities for them where they can meet each other, um, they can you know, get to know uh, others like themselves and build a sort of support and uh, community that they're really denied uh, within Muslim communities. Um, some of you may know that uh, apostates, uh, people who leave Islam across the world are um, in great danger. Um, often to come out and say that you're an atheist is a death sentence. Um, and even, even your own family will be maybe the first uh, to abuse you or to harm you in such a way. So this is the context uh, that ex-Muslims um, are, you know, are in right now. And since I've uh, started the organization, I've started to talk a little bit more about uh, the problems within the religion. And I found, um, and as some people have mentioned, that it seems that there is a little bit of a hypocrisy when it comes to uh, Islam and the way that we uh, talk about women's rights and the way we talk about liberal rights and pluralism and everything. Um, and I was really disheartened because I, I thought that the people that would be opposing me the most would be um, religious fundamentalists, you know, there would be religious apologists, the kind of people that, you know, would really, would really be the first to stand in line against me. But instead, I found that there were um, far too many people like myself. You know, I'm a liberal. I'm, I'm progressive. I vote Democrat. Uh, I'm a feminist, and I'm proud to be one. Um, and I found that there were people like myself who, who were, who were instead saying, "Sarah, you're, you're a hate monger for saying what you're, for saying what you're saying." Um, and it's just been very disheartening to see uh, that there has been such a loss of principles when it comes to uh, progressive ideals in general, liberal ideals, feminist ideals, uh, to, to the extent that I think that we favor political narratives and whatever happens to be politically convenient more than uh, the hard thing. And the hard thing is to say, look, we stand for the rights of Muslims as citizens of, of the United States and we will defend their civil liberties. And we will also stand up and say, look, there are certain parts of this religion that do not align with uh, human rights, that do not align with modern values and liberal values. And we need to be able to say both those things and talk about both those issues. And if we were to have that level of courage, and I think we wouldn't see the kind of uh, decay that we've seen in political discourse. Um, so I hope that if there's one thing that we get out of this discussion is that, you know, let's, let's do what we can to uh, reawaken a sense of political courage and ideological mm -hmm. courage and, and hardcore, you know, just talk about principles and ideologies and what they mean and be honest with ourselves and with others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. <laughs> Mark. Uh, well, I guess the thing that distinguishes me a little bit um, from the rest of the group, apart from my apparent age, is um, that I'm not so interested in free speech. I'm interested in winning. I'm a liberal. For 30 years, the politics of this country have been dominated by an increasingly rabid Republican Party. This party has been trying, apart from economic issues and other, and other sorts of things we might talk about, this party has committed itself to rolling back the rights of women to have an abortion, of African Americans to vote, and gay couples to be treated equally. Now, uh, where is this happening? It's not happening because we've had a Republican president. It's happened because Republicans control two-thirds of the state legislatures in this country. They control two-thirds of the governorships. They control 24 states outright. If they were to win two more state legislatures, they could con uh, conceivably call a constitutional convention. If you don't think that a constitutional convention in the age of Donald Trump is the biggest threat out there for African Americans, women, and gays, you're dreaming. The problem for all these groups and the identity groups who, uh, and the people who militate for their rights 
has to be seizing and holding institutional power. My book, it's available on Amazon.com. They take Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and I take, and I take Bitcoin. Um, in the book, the premise of the book is that you cannot help anyone in American politics if you do not hold offices. It's when you hold offices that you can make laws and especially you can make sure that they get enforced. Because Republicans control so much in Congress and the state legislatures, we have a constitutional right to abortion in this country that was the product of the women's movement. There are places in America where, you cannot, where a woman cannot de facto exercise her constitutional right. That's because of the Republican Party. There are states now where they're trying to roll back the voting rights of African Americans through gerrymandering and through fiddling with the opening hours of poll stations. There are states where cities have passed progressive legislation for gays and it's been overturned by a right-wing governor and state legislature. So, if I'm thinking politically and I'm worried about these groups, the first thing I want to do is to help the Democratic Party defeat the Republican Party in all these places. Not fighting the good fight in California or in Washington, D.C. or New York City, but fighting the good fight in the middle of the country, which is where power gets determined in this country right now, with swing states and also states that Republicans control. To do that, to do that, one needs a message as a party that speaks to everyone in the country, that lays out basic principles and a vision of the country that everyone can see themselves in. And the thesis of the book is that identity politics as currently practiced is preventing liberals, the left, progressives, the Democratic Party, however you want to describe that side, from holding on to institutional power and actually being the change they say they seek. And how did that happen? Well, there was a time when it was possible to talk about equal rights for these groups, civil rights movement, the women's movement, gay rights movement, without using the word identity at all. You talked about social justice. Then something happened. The word identity, the concept of identity, entered the American language, and politics was no longer a question of being committed to a cause affecting people out there, but became a species of self-expression. I am expressing my identity by getting involved in this issue or that issue. And I'm focused on politics only because of my identity, and the point of that is I need to speak truth to power. I need to call people out. I've got to fight the power. When in fact, the point of politics is to be the power. Identity movements have put themselves into a state of, at the moment, a kind of frenzy that defeats this very practical purpose. And two things happen, and, I'll, and then I'll be done. One is that, um, a rhetoric, a radical rhetoric gets employed that gets in people's faces in a way that is not helpful. Uh, Black Lives Matter, which laid out a, con a, con a call to the conscience of anyone with a conscience in this country, ended up breaking up meetings with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Suicide. But the other point, and this is where we come to free speech, is that if your politics are wrapped up with your definition of yourself, it gets very hard to have a political discussion because people feel that in disagreeing with their opinion, that you're challenging their identity. And that's what's happened on our campuses. We're no longer detached enough to argue without feeling that it's about us. 
And the big lesson we have to learn, it's not about us. It's not about how we define ourselves. It's not about intersectionality. It's not about my sensitivities. It's about fighting for justice out there for other people. And to do that, you need to retool. Thank you very much, Mark. So at this point, we're going to throw it out to audience questions. We have a couple of roaming mics. Put up your hands, roaming mics, people. But can I see some hands? Who wants to speak? So I'm going to, so panel, I'm going to take, a, as I said before, I'm going to take a handful. Don't leap in straight away. I'm going to grab a few and bring them back. So who's first? Okay. There's a gentleman here. Yeah. Before we even get to that, we're going to start this little um, Actually, this is the point in which you can make your point. If you'd have raised your hand, you could have made this question. How about... What? How about you sit down, sit down, and then just raise your hand, and you can you sit down, have your say. You raise your hand. After this gentleman has spoken, you speak, and then we address your question. That's exactly the way in which we set this up. We, we gave you an opportunity to take a seat, sir. We'll be with you after this gentleman, because he put his hand up first. Yeah, we want free speech. That means allowing everyone to speak, not just yourself. Take a seat. We'll take this gentleman's question. Then we'll go to you. Sounds like you'll be second. I think that's pretty cool. Exactly. Cool. Second is fine. Yeah? All right. Those of us... Exactly. Here. Those of us who favor free speech have the smartest, most articulate people on our side. Yet, we have been on the losing side, both on college campuses regarding free speech and in the country regarding political power. Why? Very good point. Right, I'm now going to take this gentleman here, who did take a seat, who is... So, how do you expect to embody um, an identity you've never lived in? Now, Camille, as a black man, you have, identified, you have identified with being a black man for most of your life, but how do you de-racialize yourself when you've seen the numbers? You know that, I hope that you know, that in the state of New Jersey, black people make up about 12% of the population, yet there's a 12 to 1 ratio for blacks to whites in prisons. Uh, Why? of black people make up the prison system. Why? How do you really say that the left and the right are both equal, but Trumpism started out with Trump saying that all Mexicans are racist and need to leave this country. So I do not understand how you want to disidentify us when our identities are what kind of make us now. Us being black men, we are targeted because of the color of our skin. We are not saying that our blackness has a share the same ideologies. We disagree now on politics and liberalism. I can tell. I've seen some of your interviews phenomenal speaker, but we differ greatly with our ideologies. And that's not because I'm black and you're white, we're both black men. How do we stand with this making college campuses unsafe spaces? How can any of you, how can anybody in this room truly be fine with becoming an unsafe space? The notion of, of unsafe should not enter anybody's mind. Thank you very much. I think at this point, at this point, I want to bring some more people in. No, actually, you're not running this meeting, so I'm going to take some more questions. Who else wants to speak? I, re I then we'll have one over here. Yes, that's exactly how this is working. Can we get a microphone to this lady? Please? My comment is based off of thinking. Hello. Um, so you talked about like identity movements and okay, so then like America is based off like it's built off the backbone of slaves, correct? Like this country is the entire like everyone has their own identity. The fact that we have Columbus Day is because other white people felt the need to have their own identity. The reason that people are so mad at alternative like affirmative action is because white people see a like example, let's say the Kennedys, right? White women the most More women white women benefit from affirmative action than black women, than any black people in this entire country. But a black child who has the same grade, GPA, SAT scores, and as a another white woman who has the same grade, GPA, SAT scores, will then be looked at as affirmative action. And that's what we have to understand. Like, 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 that's what we have to understand
unique spot to go to that school because their parents went there. It's what it's like everyone has their own identity. And the best way that people benefit from it is having other people as the other. When there's an other, other people benefit. So we can't sit here and pretend that like if we throw away all our identities, it'll make a difference. Like I'm Pentecostal, I'm Haitian, my parents are immigrants, but I still have to identify with the fact that I'm a black woman living in America and I have certain privileges for the fact that like I am a straight black woman in America. I do not face the same consequences that cisgender women in this country face. I do not feel like the same pain that other people, like Muslim women in this country feel because I am Pentecostal. You have no right if you are not a part of that religion to look at someone else and tell them that they are oppressed. It is not your place to stop someone that they are in their own religion that they are oppressed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Point well made. If there's no one else at any more, any more from any more at this point. Tell you what, let's bring it. We've, we've had quite, there's one there, just right next to you. And then we'll bring it back. Yes. Hi. I guess my question slash statement is like, how can we say it's not about intersectionality or about identities when for certain people they don't have the privilege of just turning their identity off? I can't turn off the fact that I'm black. I still have to, like, I live in this body every day. So I feel like to tell people that um, it's not about their identity, they have to separate that aspect of it from their emotions and how they feel about things, almost is like telling someone to ignore their life experiences. Because ultimately that's what they're experiencing every single day in that body, in that color, skin, in that gender, in that sexuality. You, regardless, actually not necessarily every identity is visible, but in terms of people who have visible identity, it's very hard to tell them or expect them to erase that identity or separate that from the way that they view certain politics or experiences because honestly, like, that's like telling someone that they didn't experience what they experienced. If I experienced racism today, and it was based strictly on my race. Like, I can't sit tomorrow and say, oh, okay, well, racism is a problem, but like I'm saying, it's not because I'm black. But, I don't know, I just feel like it's very hard to separate identity from politics when people are forced to live within their identity. Yes, thank you very much. Right, I am gonna come back out, guys, but right now we've got, there's plenty there, so I wanna bring back our panel on it. So Camille, do you wanna kick us off? Respond to anything you've heard or any questions particularly posed at you? It's, uh, it's very challenging to sort of have a conversation like this. There's a lot of threads that have been opened, uh, and I'll try to be both succinct and sort of broadly respond, uh, responsive to the, to the things that have been raised here. Um, I think one of the fundamental challenges that we have uh, in this country is that while we all agree on the value of free speech in uh, a very metaphysical sense. We talk about it in the same high-sounding lang language. Uh, we don't mean the same thing uh, when we talk about free speech. Um, I, I don't know that most of us really have an appreciation for what speech protections are for and what they ought to be accomplishing. Um, the notion that, for example, hate speech is not free speech is wrong. Hate speech is, in fact, protected speech. Um, in fact, hate speech, legally speaking, is not a thing in the United States of America. It is not a category of thing. It is, in fact, incredibly difficult to get people to agree on what hate speech is. And I think this is an important distinction to make because for so many years in this country, um, and I'm pointing to the 1960s in particular, speech protections were used by minority groups who were fighting for civil rights, and it was essential for them to be able to secure those rights in order to advocate. The reason why Martin Luther King, for example, wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail, from a Birmingham jail, is because he was imprisoned for effectively violating speech codes, handing out flyers in the wrong spot, all of these various things. Um, I, I think this is something that we don't Black necessarily Black understand. Black Black this is interesting. Black Black let's, let's, give them, let's, give them, let's give them a second. Has anyone disagreed with that? Has anyone disagreed with that principle? Have you ever gone someplace and had someone Black scream Black Lives, Black Lives Matter and had someone respond that that's not true? Yes, quite a few times. They've said that's not true? Well, guess what? None of those, none of, none of those, okay, well, hold on a second, hold on a second. No, 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 no. No one, check, check this out, check this out. Check this out. Can I, can I, can I finish? Yeah, like for real. I am with everyone trying to respect you must speak. There are some people here. This is an opportunity for us to really educate ourselves on what's going on in reality. And like I'm gonna let the panelists speak, but after the panelists speak, 
there is something that I need to say because when we talk about identity, we need to understand that this country was formed off of creating whiteness and separating blackness. So we can't separate. No, 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 no. We cannot separate our yeah, identity. Yeah, this is our this isn't the. We we just said, this, is this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. Camille's going to finish his point. We're going to go down the panel. We're going to Then we're coming back out. We're going to come back. Yeah, history. Do you, do facts, matter? Sir, you do facts matter? Do facts matter? Do facts matter? All right, hey, 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 this is how this works. If people shout, no one. So we'll keep, so we'll, so we'll continue. Who so, controls the facts? It's the system. It's the institution. Don't tell me about facts. I don't need no facts. Don't okay. tell me that I am in a state of oppression because of the state. And I don't need no Republican or no Democrat to help me for my freedom. Because I'm not doing Hillary Clinton in this office. Okay, that's a whole nother topic. Now how about this at this point? We we let Camille finish his point, we go down the panel, and then we come back out. The more you shout, the less everyone in this room has an opportunity to make their point and to listen to everyone else. I'm sure you do. I like what he was saying if he put his hand up. Yeah. Yeah. It's colonialism. It is the fact that you have one group of people control over another group of people. That's what it was. It has nothing to do with anything y'all saying up there. Because right. what I heard was this constant thing of let's both be on a reaction that happened. Thank you, sir. I agree with that. I'm done. Thank you. Real. I do. I do think. I do think. Um, you know, I, I wonder. I wonder about the specific. The specific point that I've made that one might dispute, like with respect to the data on police shootings, for example. And I, I wonder about that because it seems, it seems odd to me for one to invest themselves in a concept that they agree has been contrived and invented, right? Like, I suspect most of the people here would not be particularly excited if Richard Spencer was to walk into the room. Um, and you might not really want him to come here and talk because if were he to talk about race, he would talk about um, the fact that it's a source of pride, the fact that he believes it's a source of power, the fact that he believes that his race is beautiful. The fact that one can make those claims about whiteness and one can immediately recognize just how retrograde and backwards it is to talk about race in that way. And that one can make the same, and that one can make the same claims about some other race and not recognize how retrograde those ideas are. What's retrograde isn't the embrace of whiteness, it's the embrace of race. I care about the things that you care about. There's not a person in this room that thinks people should be dying unnecessarily. I care about mass incarceration. I think it's deeply problematic, but I also know that if the United States of America were to release every brown and black person from prison today, federal and state, I'm, I'm, can I finish my point? Can I finish my point? We have, we're not even going to finish this down yet. We're going to go. Friday, if, if they were to release them all, the United States would still be, and I've made this point in a room full of conservative leaders, um, con making it important for them to get it that if they were all be released from jail, the United States would still be fifth or sixth in the world in terms of its rate of incarceration. That's problematic. If we want to fix this problem, talking about it narrowly in terms of race is not going to help us get to solutions. We've been doing that for three or four years now, while Black Lives Matter has been very active since Ferguson. Talk to me about the federal reforms that have been achieved. There aren't any. That's problematic. I want to fix these problems too. My concern is that disrupting conversations like this makes it harder for us to solve those problems. Thank you. Well said. Black lives do matter. That is why I wrote the article. I study political movements as my job as an intel analyst. My job is to look into the group, diagnose its strengths and weaknesses, and my old job is to defeat it. 
My new purpose is to try to help these groups out, especially the ones in the United States. And if you read the article, you would realize that my support for the movement was front and center. I have worked with police. I've gone on ride-alongs with them. I have seen the world through their eyes, and I've asked them, what about the effects of Black Lives Matter? And they almost always say the same thing. They've got good ideas, but when we start saying, listen, we don't think this one will work, conversation over. People stand up and start screaming. Black lives do matter. But my criticism of the movement was to try to help it so it could be more effective, which means distancing itself from extremist type rhetoric, extremist actions. And the prediction that I put in there was that if the Black Lives Matter leaders did not do this, did not distance themselves from the extremists, did not remove the leaders that were extremist, that their image as a whole would suffer. And look what happened. Dallas happened. The Dallas shooter had nothing to do with Black Lives Matters, nothing to do with that movement. How did it get put on it? <laughs> if the movement had a strong anti-violence, pro-working, pro-ideas, it would be in a much better place. Thank you, Brian. No, we're going to go to Sarah first, who's been waiting very patiently, and then we're going to go to Mark, then we're going to come back out. Sarah, please. Well, I just, I, I don't have too much to say about, about Black Lives Matter uh, in particular, but I will talk about generally identity politics. Uh, I'm not, uh, I guess it, it depends on how we define identity politics, but I don't think movements based on identity are necessarily uh, corrosive or destructive to dialogue. I mean, we know about civil rights movements that have been that have been beneficial in, in, in many ways, and feminist movements that have been beneficial in many ways. I think when identity, move, identity movements go wrong is when they make claims that, such as, only I can know this thing, and you, as somebody who doesn't share my identity, have no right to, to talk about it with me or to challenge my opinion. Um, and of course, that, that isn't to say that experience doesn't matter. Like, experience is extremely important, and we learn things from other people's experiences, particularly minorities and, and people who are, who are oppressed. Uh, historically, when we hear them, we realize, okay, well, I've been trapped in my own mind, but now I know that this issue exists, and now I can focus on it and pay attention to it. Uh, but that is empathy, that is sympathy, that is progress. That's how you move forward, is that you have these conversations and you hope that you can reach this person and you don't say, I have exclusive rights to this knowledge that no one can share, that no one can know. Because if that was the case, we wouldn't be able to build coalitions. We've been able to move past a lot of retrograde ideas. We no longer think that women are unequal to men in many ways. We've, in, in Western society, it's not perfect, but it's much better than it was. And how did it get here? It got here because feminists were able to talk to people that were that were men that didn't have that experience and say look here are my concerns and here's what's going on and they were some some men many men now were able to say okay i understand what that means i don't have that experience but i understand what that means so experience has absolutely has a role but it's it can't be the end of the conversation because if it is the end of the conversation then there is no conversation there is no coalition and that is the death of progress so if we want to move towards racial progress and 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 end this injustice and a lot of the points that were raised i mean i agree with i think that absolutely absolutely terrible the way that that blacks have been treated throughout american history and it's absolutely a stain um, on this country that we still bear, but hey, how do we move forward? What is the best way to move forward is the question that we should be, we should be um, thinking about. Um, and uh, one uh, woman did mention a little bit, she said just for just, just a little bit, she threw out that who, who am I or who is anybody to say to a woman that's wearing the hijab that she's, or, or a Muslim woman that she's, and she didn't say hijab, but a Muslim woman that she is oppressed. Um, I'm not saying, to, I'm not telling any woman that she is oppressed. I'm not saying that. I know that when I was Muslim, if someone had told me that I'm oppressed and I just don't understand my religion, I would have flipped them off and I would have said, how dare you? Because I would have found that to be incredibly insulting. 
So I don't think that that's the way that you should, you should proceed. But here is the reality uh, with the way that the religion works. There are passages in the scripture that make it very clear that women have an unequal space with men. There is a verse in the Quran that says a man, a husband has a right to discipline his wife. There is no right for the wife to discipline a husband. There's just a husband has that right. And the verse just on its own, forget about how, whether someone feels empowered by it or oppressed by it or whatever, the verse on its own is misogynist. The verse on its own is sexist. So if we're going to have conversations about what we need to do with this religion, we need to at least honestly recognize that that exists because throughout the Muslim history and across the Muslim world, women's rights are nowhere near where they should be. And the first people to stand up against women's rights and against women's empowerment are religious conservatives. And that's a reality and we have to be able to talk about that. Thank you very much, Sarah. Mm. Oh. Um. I'm old enough to remember the politics of the late 60s and early 70s. And I can tell you how this movie ends. This movie ends with you accomplishing nothing. Because the only thing that makes America change is power. It's not about how you define yourself, how you define your experience, or any of that, if you want to protect yourself as a group, you must have power. And you cannot have power alone. That means you need allies. And that means you have to find a way of speaking, as Sarah was just saying, that builds bridges. You cannot tell people simultaneously, you must understand me and you cannot understand me. You must become more political creatures. You can talk about racial justice, social justice, gender justice without mentioning your identity. I don't give a damn about how you define yourself. I want you as an ally to fight in the fight. It's not about you. It's not about me and how I define myself. It's about a fight out there. So let's just grow up and start fighting. Thank you, Mark. So let's take some more questions. Where are the Roman mics? So I can see it. There's a gentleman with his hand up there. How's it going? Hey. So, um, Mr. Staskavage, you said in the beginning you had three questions, being like, are you worried that people are radicals? How many are you radicals? And then how many are, uh, are you scared of radicals coming forth? And most of us said we weren't scared of radicals coming forth. And I didn't raise my hand either. And I find that to be a mistake because then I heard Professor Lila talk and you know, at first he said, I'm not interested in free speech. And I'm sure he did that to be provocative and sexy and everything. And then, and then uh, he comes forth. Yeah. And then he comes forth and uses the classic liberal buzzwords, uh, you know, women, gay people, and black people. And that he is, as a professor, he's in a position of power. He is the one that I'm worried about affecting the minds of young people coming to their college and having, looking to develop their political ideals and then having the, him as their authority with these radical ideals that, you know, screw half the, I mean, screw, I'm sorry, uh, you know, screw conservatives, screw the two thirds of the governor, screw the, you said 24 states are conservative. That means 26 of them more than likely are Democratic. Is, is that not? Democrats control seven states. Seven states, okay. I apologize for my ignorance. Um, but, you know, if you see the rise of the anti-fascist movement, Mr. Saskavage, it's because there's something feeding into this. And as you've seen, it's grown even. And a lot of it, I feel, comes from there's someone older, in power, telling them, telling these, you know, empty, blank slate minds mm that it's okay to be violent to gain yeah. power, to gain political means. I think, we've, I think we've got the point, thank you very much. Let's come down here. Joseph, there's just a bloke in the middle there with a purple shirt on. Yeah. Hi. Um, I think I might try to distill some of the things people said uh, tonight into an interesting question. I, I agree with Mr. Lilla that identity politics hasn't worked for Democrats or liberals, but there is a place where it has worked. 
it's worked in white identity politics. And I'm curious why it is that liberal identity politics has failed in this country, and yet we have a president and a political party that can rally people around that type of identity politics. And what do we do about that? Thank you very much. So I'm gonna take this lady here, this gentleman here, and then we'll come back, but we will come back out again. Hi, um, my question is to Sarah. Um, I follow you on Facebook and I repost a lot of the things. I mean, I don't know if you're writing all the stuff, but I know it's got your stamp of approval. Um, I'm very interested, you know, I'm, re I'm reading Douglas Murray's book and I'm, I'm a big fan of Majid Nawaz and the whole thing. I'm, I'm worried, I'm not worried, I'm, I'm questioning a couple different things and I'll make it brief. One is I think that the American experience of the Muslim community is very different than what's going on in Europe. Am I correct in saying that in general? Uh, and, I, and so I just want to sort of get your sort of take on that um, and, and, um, and I guess also there's a sort of you know, gray area which I think really um, connects to this identity politics thing we're talking about. There's this sort of gray area where if you criticize Islam, everyone says, oh, you're you know, Islamophobic, you're anti-Muslim, and, um, and so you, you comes down to you really can't criticize an idea, and there's this gray area where people say, but you know, the people that are next, my neighbors that are Muslims, they're, they don't want to kill you. you know, how do you deal with that gray area? Is it just sheer numbers? That, that the people who are Islamists are, are a larger person. I, just, I would just like to hear what you kind of, your sort of standard thing that you say about yeah. this, because I think it's very interesting. Thank you for that. And Joseph, we just pass it to this gentleman here, then we'll come back, but we will come back out. Okay, just uh, something I want to say quickly uh, about, it's, it's a statement and you guys could touch on it, just uh, about uh, identity politics. Uh, looking at, at the world and all social phenomena strictly through a racial prism, I think, engenders a certain type of myopia. Um, I'm a Puerto Rican guy from the Bronx raised in a single parent household. And it's like, but what does that mean? Should I think a certain way because of that? I don't. And you know, people like diversity as a thing. Diversity is a thing that we all speak of. It's a value. How many people care about idea diversity? I wonder how many protesters here have read Thomas So or John McCorder or Jason Riley, but read it openly, you know, to receive it. So it's just something I wonder about, like, why would you want to build an ideological prison around yourself? And I've heard people say that, you know, they can't disconnect from identity. I fear they wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you very much. <laughs> right, we'll bring the panel back at this point. Just kick things off, let's mix it up a little bit. Sarah, do you want to respond to the question that was put to you? Sure. Um, well, there's a lot there, so I'm just gonna generally touch on uh, some of the issues that I think are really important when it comes to immersion of Muslim populations. Uh, there is a difference between the European Muslims, generally speaking, and American Muslims. American Muslims are much better integrated, they're much more educated, uh, they're much more likely to support liberal values. They may be the most liberal Muslims in the world. So there's something that we're doing right here. Uh, some of that might just be the kinds of people that are coming in. Uh, American system of immigration has been different. We accept less refugees, um, less, less uh, low-skilled migrants than Europeans do. Um, so you know, you'll have the Pakistani doctors that'll come to America, but perhaps uh, that won't be the case in other countries, um, or you're more likely to be able to get in. So that's a, that's a huge part of it, that there's a certain kind of person that's just coming in. Um, and then there's the idea that, that uh, American society is, is, is a melting pot. I think, you know, uh, my European friends um, just don't, just bristle a little bit when I, when I talk about this. Uh, but I do think that the approach to immigration um, has, to, has to entail that, that when someone's coming into this country, they have an opportunity to be fully American. Not, not American with, you know, uh, you know just, just a little bit different kind of a citizen, but, but the same kind of citizen. And this is why it's so important to, to stand up for civil liberties of Muslims. That is to say that Muslims uh, can and should be able to talk about their religion, they can and should be able to express their, their rights, their, the, the, their outrage, and, and share that with everyone, and they should be treated like all the other citizens, because that helps them feel like they're a part of this nation, and that they, their, their destiny is tied to ours, and that this is really a project that we have to take together. That's a very important feeling. Um, I, 
just historically the way that um, immig immigration happened in Europe where so many of them were migrants. And so there was this idea that they're going to come in and they're going to leave. It's going to be a guest worker thing. So there was always a little bit of an idea that they're not here to stay. Um, so that's part of it, at least in, the, at least in England. Um, but I think overall, you have to be able to look at citizenship as something that anyone can achieve fully. You know, and anyone can be 100% American, uh, including Muslim Americans. And that's a very important feeling, and I think that changes the way that you feel about your duty towards the country. Um, and that affects the way that you might be, you know, walking towards a more radical way of looking. Thanks, Sarah. And um, Mark, I was wondering if you might address the question from the back, as far as, <laughs> is it liberal professors who are kind of feeding this climate? Um, well, yeah, well, I want to put that in, in connection with the other question, right? Um, because, what I felt, correct me if I'm wrong, behind uh, the young man's comment was that um, why are you focusing on all of these groups and leaving everyone else out? What about everyone else who aren't part of these special groups, <clears throat> excuse me, that liberals say they care about? Um, and that can lead to a kind of frustration and resentment. And that is what, I'm not talking about you at all, but that is the kind of thing that feeds a racism that's already there and turns it into a kind of white nationalism that you see in places like Charlotte. It feeds the machine, why? Because it feeds a picture of the world and a picture of this country of groups simply being set against each other. And that works for them, it does not work for us. That's the lesson to be learned. These kind of appeals work for them. They cost us. And we need to think about tactically, strategically, what to talk about, how, and when. Does that mean we're gonna be able to say everything that we feel in our hearts? Not if we wanna win. Are there venues for that? Right? But that's precisely why, in the book I talk about, why it's important to pull, let's say, the white working class that feels some of this resentment. I grew up around a lot of these people. I grew up, in, I grew up a mile away from Eminem in Detroit. And I remember the first day I heard the word, the N word. It was July 23rd, 1967 when the day after the Detroit riots started and there were kids across the street who started walking up and down in front of the house with baseball bats saying, we're just waiting for the niggers. And I never heard the word. And I asked my mother what it meant. And she got furious with me for using it. I know what people like that can be like. And there's gotta be a way to talk about what we share as citizens, the principles we share, where everyone can see themselves in it so we don't sink to this level. And, um, and so if our strategy is to actually take power, so, so I want to give Steve Bannon a bad day every day. I don't want us making his lunch for him, which is what he says we're doing by focusing so much and using uh, on, on so real social problems in terms of identity. I want him to have a bad day. I want to get him out of power, him and his people. Well, how practically do you do that? Well, once you start talking about that and thinking hard, your tactics are gonna change. Thank you, Mark. And um, no, hold on, Camille, any, if you wanna to respond to anything you've heard. Um, I this will probably be the, uh, the most unpopular thing I say all evening. Um, so I'm going to double down and perhaps say two unpopular things. Um, first of all, I'm not a, I'm not a progressive. Uh, I'm also not a conservative. My politics are decidedly libertarian. Um, I believe in really kooky things like legalizing all drugs and not locking people in cages for voluntarily deciding to use drugs or to hire a prostitute or whatever else. I'm glad that's a popular idea. Um, so I'm, I don't know um, that identity politics don't work. I don't have a perspective on that. Um, I do know that they tend to obscure 
a lot of the important underlying phenomena that we are trying to discuss. If, for example, when I talk about mass incarceration, it is surprising to you to discover that letting all of the black people and the Latino people out of cages in this country, getting them out of state and federal prisons would still make the United States a world leader in incarceration, you haven't been thinking about this problem that you claim to care about in the appropriate way. If, for example, when I suggest to you that the police aren't overkilling black people relative to certain metrics, again, you're not thinking about this problem deeply enough, so you're not talking about solutions in a constructive, insane way. If you're smirking once I say something like that, if it's immediately outrageous to you that I would suggest these things, then again, to have an ally who routinely talks to conservatives and is routinely advocating for reform and for change, to not recognize that the Charles Koch organization was one of the first organizations, national organizations in this country working on criminal justice reform. Again, you're thinking about this in the wrong way. One of the first sort of prominent ones um, uh, in recent years uh, during the Obama administration. Um, the last point I'll make uh, is about the Trump, the Trump administration, and this is going to be deeply unpopular here. Um, white lash, racial resentment as an explanation for how we got to the Trump administration. Um, I don't know if that washes. Um, and the reason I don't know if it washes is because I don't see it in the exit polling data. The fact that white people voted for Barack Obama twice and then decided to vote for Donald Trump doesn't suggest to me that the reason they voted for him is racial resentment. I have never seen an exit poll that says that's why they voted for him. Um, one can choose to vote for a candidate for any number of reasons. I suspect that people who voted for George W. Bush, for example, the second time, didn't do it because they thought well, he lied about weapons of mass destruction, and I really love that. One can invent a narrative that makes the people who disagree with them the most despicable human beings on Earth that doesn't mean that narrative is true. It's interesting that minority groups, Latinos and blacks, voted for this horrible, despicable, racist Donald Trump in greater numbers than they had percentage-wise for any recent Republican candidate. This seems important. If these things are true, then perhaps that particular factoid, which at this point is received wisdom, it is gospel truth, when actually what we're doing is we're taking a particular belief that we have about other people's beliefs, and we have concretized it. We have turned it into a physical object. It is this talismanic thing that we know. We don't even have to debate it. Um, and I've asked repeatedly in various contexts, bright people who talk about politics on a regular basis, well, what, is, what are you latching on to, Van Jones, when on the night of the election, having seen zero exit polls, you say, well, what happened is a white lash. Maybe, but you'll have to show me the evidence. Thank you, Camille. And uh, Brian, hold on. We're coming back out for final points in the second. First, we'll hear Brian. So to answer your question about Antifa or Antifa or however to explain it, um, I've talked to, I've actually debated a professor who was an acknowledged anarchist. Um, it was at a community college in Connecticut. Uh, th this individual actually was a, a professor of one of the quote unquote elite liberal arts schools in New England. Um, there's a couple of secrets about professors. One, they're terrible debaters for the most part. And two, if you stand up to them and you argue back with them, it's a learning experience. This particular professor went through the whole gambit of calling me a Nazi and a racist and all these things. And I looked at him square in the eye and I said, the difference between you and me is that you want to force people to your beliefs. I'm trying to convince them. And he had no response to that. And that's what it comes down to. Um, in terms of diversity of opinion, that is a great point. There's a funny thing that happened from the 1970s to today, which is the share of professors at universities, especially elite universities, who are conservative versus liberal. And this is what happened. The diversity movement out of the 70s came forward and said, we need to have more diversity at campus, more diversity of background. And universities were like, that's a good idea. If we fast forward 
from the 1970s, when conservative professors are about 40, 35% of the campus, to today, in elite New England schools, it's at a 28 to 1 ratio. What happened? Universities, more than likely, waited for the conservative professors to retire and replaced them with white women and a couple of diverse candidates. Now you have campuses that are almost 100% one ideological point of view, and you wonder why these echo chambers are pumping out crazies. Thank you, Brian. On okay, that point, I just want to, we've got very, very little time left. I'm going to grab three points on the floor, and I'm going to bring it back for final points. I want three people who haven't spoken before, and I see there's a lady in the back there with a hand up, glasses, just there. <laughs> I'm too English for this. I'm, sorry. I'm not interested in microaggressions. I am interested in macroaggressions. And what people are responding to in this room is structural inequality and institutional racism. When you say, Jamal, that race is, yeah. in, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, is an invention. That's true, it is invented. But it doesn't make it any less real. Wednesday is also a social creation, and 9 a.m. is a social creation. Right. But if I don't show up to work at 9 a.m. on Wednesday, I will be fired, and that too is very real. I think that's okay. a really strong point, but I just Hold want to grab two. No, 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 no. I am the senior organizer for the faculty on this campus. I'll say something about structural inequality and racism. Briefly, 3.9% of the tenure track faculty, which is to say the people who actually have academic freedom, are black. And a state where well over 13, 14% are black. And yet the people who are adjuncts here, who are paid like lettuce pickers, $5,000 a class, who have no access to health insurance, and therefore no academic freedom, that is where you have people of color well overrepresented in, in their numbers. Right. You have 2.6% Latino faculty who are tenure track who have any kind of protections. I am not here to defend the Democrats or the Republicans. They, on a bipartisan level, have forced it upon us this absolute exchange of wealth from working class people to the rich. And what people are responding to is imperialism. What people are responding to is the fact that 40% of the black children in the country are in poverty. We are responding to the fact that you feel comfortable. Point well made. A point well made. No, I want to get two more people in. There is a gentleman here who's had his hand up for a very long time and has been very patient. Thank you. Please let this gentleman speak. Let a week go by without a black trans woman in this country getting killed. Exactly. Let's hear from this gentleman. Let's hear from this gentleman. And then we're going to come back. Thank you. I'll take it. So my my question is sorry my question is directed at Brian and Camille. Camille, Camille sorry, Camille. Okay. Just like the girl's name. <laughs> so my, my, my question is directed to you guys. Racial inequality exists in the United States. We all know the statistics about the criminal justice system, education outcomes, and housing. We may disagree about how much is about culture and personal responsibility. But obviously some of this inequality is explained by prejudice. And actually a survey by the General Social Club, basically called the General Social Survey, from the University of Chicago, found that 28% of white Americans would support an individual homeowner's right to discriminate on the basis of race. That's 28% of white Americans. And again, this is the General Social Survey from the University of Chicago. So my question is, how can anyone on this panel really say identity shouldn't matter when people are treated differently in America based on these identities? I'm going to bring this back to the panel now because we're fast running out of time. And these gentlemen from the police here will shut me up as soon as we run over. So I'm now going to bring the panel in um, for your final points. Just take a minute or two. I know it's not much. Just to offer a final thought for our audience here. Um, and then we shall close. So I'm going to go down the line. So Mark, if you'd like to go first. <clears throat> um, I haven't heard a single person in the room tell me how you're going to change the power structure in this country if you do not win elections. 
Protests will not do it. Protests will not do it. No one is listening to you. No one is listening to you in these red states. You are the only way a protest works is if you have people susceptible to your protest. And those are Democrats. They are not Republicans. They do not care about you. Then you're useless. Then you'll be devoting. Then you. Then you will be thinking that the world historical struggles are the struggles of of teaching assistants at Rutgers. We are talking about. If you're serious about structural racism in this country, you want to seize power. It's the only way to do it. You have. Welcome to the NFL. This is how it works. You are just expressing your impotence. You have a way of taking all this energy, all this energy, and actually take back one state. If you could take back one state from the Republicans and make them stop taking away the rights of black people to vote, that would be an accomplishment. Go do it. Go and do it. Hold on. Hold on. You are not telling me how you're going to take power. This argument can continue in the bar you're afterwards. Impotent. First of you're all, impotent. I want to hear the final points from our panel. Thank you. Please take a seat, sir. Please take a seat. Please take a seat. Thank you. Thank you. We are, are you telling, me, are, are, are you telling me that there is no difference in the laws in those states where a woman can't get an abortion and black people are finding it hard to vote? No difference between those states and California and New York? You're dreaming, man. You are Sir, dreaming. Please, both of you, please take a seat. We are very close to the end of this meeting and I'm very desperate for a drink. Please take a seat and we can move on. Take a seat, please. Gents. I want to hear what our panel have to say, and then we're going to close. We've heard from both of you. We've had plenty of time for that. I'm now. I... You've made your point. You've made your point. I want to hear three points from these guys, and then we're going to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, we have listened. This is the thing. No one can listen when everyone's shouting. That's what I'm saying. No one can listen. <laughs> I, here's what I want to do. Here's what I want to do. Hey, how about this? How about this? How about this? We gave as many as we possibly could. So now I'm going to go to Sarah for a final point. And hopefully, I think that people will be conciliatory enough to hear us speak, and then we can carry on this argument in other formats afterwards. Sarah, please. Well, I, I, I'll just say one more thing. I agreed with everything Mark had to say, which is not that none of those injustices exist. Of course they exist. I agree they exist. But how are you going to solve the problem? You can't just, dis what are you going to do? Just write your way to the White House? That's not how it works. Or protest your way to the White House? That's not how it works. You gotta change someone's mind. You gotta get them to see your point of view. I already see your point of view, but other people don't. So how are you going to reach Listen them? To her, that speak, has please. to be a question that you have to consider. Otherwise, he's right, you won't win. And then we'll have more Trump. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, Thank you. Now. So what is your solution? What's your solution? What's your solution? What is your solution? Now, 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 I'm going. How now does I'm that go change? This is a democracy. This is a democracy. Guys. How does that change guys, the vote? Please, please. We are so, so close to being out of here. I want to hear Brian's final point. How? <laughs> I'm, I'm enjoying it, but I also enjoy actually being able to hear people. So I'm going to go. I'm going to go to Sarah. If you've got nothing else you want to say, you made your point. Brian, please, your final thoughts, please. If we could just listen for a couple of seconds, thank you. Democrats. Shh. Democrats are in for a rude awakening in 2018, aren't they? The divisions in the party, quite apparent. That being said, 
It's not that identity does not matter. It's not that we don't recognize that racism is an issue or that bigotry is an issue. The difference is simply about how to solve the problem. That's it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. And what are you doing? So, Camille, take us out. You know, one of the, one of the remarkable hold on, hold on, protesting hold on, hold on. is hold on. not enough. One of the, one of the, one of the, one of the remarkable things that's happened to me in the last couple of weeks is I had an opportunity to talk to a, I had an opportunity to talk to a gentleman by the name of uh, Michael Bell. Uh, Michael Bell Sr. lives in Kenosha, Wisconsin. His his son, Michael Brown Jr., was shot to death by the Kenosha, Wisconsin police. Um, he was shot to death in front of his home with his mother and his sister watching. Uh, Michael Bell had blonde hair. This was eight to ten years before uh, Mike Brown was shot in Ferguson. Um, Michael Bell um, is a remarkable human being. Um, I, I hope you'll go look for his piece in the New York Times after this. Just Google his name and you'll find it. Um, what's remarkable about Michael Bell is he is not a man who today is filled with resentment, who believes that all police officers are terrible or awful. You know who Michael Bell is? I'm sorry? No, no, Michael Bell Sr. is alive. His son, Michael Bell Jr., was shot to death by the Kenosha, Wisconsin police. That was the beginning of what I said. Uh, you probably missed it because there's a lot of stuff going on in here. It, and that, this is, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually proceeding to a point, if you'll, if you'll allow, we're almost done, I'll hang around for a little bit afterwards. But the thing that is so amazing about Michael Bell's, um, the thing that's so amazing about Michael Bell's story is that Michael Bell's father was an aviation engineer. Um, what he was astonished by was that after the shooting, within about 48 hours, the police had largely cleared themselves. What he discovered is what any of you might discover if you dared to look, that the police often are responsible for investigating themselves after something like this takes place. Michael Bell's, father, Michael Bell's father was successful in getting a first in the nation law passed requiring that in Wisconsin, when these things happen, they will be investigated by outside organizations. That has happened in the last 12 months. His son was killed well over a decade ago. It took a decade of work to do this. He said the reason why this is so important to him is because he wants to ensure that no family has to endure this again. Here's my charge to you. Focus on policies that work and get results for the specific things that you're interested in. What, what did I just, this is so weird. I think, I think that working on, working on particular issues, I think working on particular issues of consequence is a real opportunity for us. And I think Michael Bell Sr. has the right idea. Getting that law passed is the right thing to do. And I think it's the sort of thing that one could replicate all across the country. No, Thanks for the evening. <laughs> if we could have a round of applause for all of our speakers, please. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Please come and speak to us at the end. We're spite, we're spite US, we're doing the unsafe space tour. Tell us what you think. Our friends at the IHS are interested. So please do that. And of course, some of the speakers will be hanging around if you want to have a chat with us. Thank you so much, everyone.